Hi and welcome to Answer XL Arctic Live. Um, great to have you all with us. Um, really wonderful to join this live investigation looking at the Arctic food web. Now we're currently in the UK Arctic Research Station and that's in the International Science Village of Neolosund and that's the northernmost permanent settlement in the world. We're on the island of Svalbard and that's halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. Now during today's live investigation we'll give you a general introduction uh, to the project, where we are, we'll go outside have a look around and then we'll come in and talk through food webs and the kinds of animals and living things that are found in the Arctic. Then we will have the opportunity to do a little bit of Q&A so if you've got any questions do send them through on the live chat and we'll have a little time at the end of this session to go through those as well. Um, before we start off let's just have a look at some of the countries who are watching. We have the UK, USA, Panama, Spain, Colombia, Canada and Croatia. Welcome uh, one and all. And we have shout outs um, to Mrs. Grabeel and Mrs. Markham's first grade students at Flatwoods Elementary in Lee County, Virginia. Hi everyone at Lee County, um, in Lee County Flatwoods Elementary. Um, uh, say hi to our year four students uh, at Al Mundaka International School in Granada, Spain. Um, big hi to all you guys, all the year fours. And apparently you're going to make great explorers. So really hope um, to see you up here in years to come. Um, we have a home ed student from Flintshire, um, and that's Rue, who's 11. Um, big welcome to you. Hi, Rue. Uh, and the first graders at P.D. Graham Elementary School in Westland, Michigan. Really great to have you with us. Um, thanks so much for joining. Uh, so my name's Jamie. Uh, from Encounter EDU and I will be taking you through this Arctic food web live investigation but I just want to show you a little bit of where we are so I'm just going to grab my microphone I know wired mics up here and uh, the wind's got up a bit outside I'm going to hold this very close let's see if we can get out here Oh, we're a bit sheltered, we're a bit sheltered. Wow. So here we are. Um, hopefully the sand's not too windy. So down here we can see the Kongsfjorden. And fjord is the name for a sea inlet. And this is the sea coming in from the Atlantic. You may be able to make out a couple of icebergs. And then this is where we're sampling. So this is where the science team are going out in the boats to look at ocean chemistry and to trawl for plastics and plankton. You might be able to make out the bluish tinge of the glacier at the head of the fjord. Uh, that's about 10 kilometers away, so about six miles. And the air is really clear, so I mean that distance looks far, far closer. And then the, the peaks, the sort of blackish peaks you can see in the distance, are a further 10 kilometers, so 12 miles from where you are, but see them really, really clearly. An amazingly beautiful um, part of the world, a bit chillier at the moment. It's probably about minus um, 10, minus 15 uh, Celsius wind chill. I'm afraid you're going to have to work that out um, into Fahrenheit. Coming around, we're based in the UK Arctic Research Station. Has come around. That's this building here, and what that means is that we've got a a sort of base of operations. We're not camping on the sea ice. Um, we're not sort of <laughs> in freezing cold tents. We have bedrooms. We have um, hot showers. Um, there is a sort of sitting room. There's some lab space, offices, all that kind of infrastructure, and that means that we are able to go out um, into this environment. Um, Hannah and Clara have just been out on the fjord over here collecting water samples in a very bumpy sea um, and uh, collecting, sort of looking at plastics at different depths. Uh, the waves have been up, um, 
you know, there's been people being sick overboard. Uh, but the plus point is that they did spot a minky whale on this this last sampling trip. Um, but I can feel my fingers um, beginning to go a little bit. Um, after eight trips in the polar regions, your fingers become much more sensitive um, to the cold. And ordinarily, I would be wearing gloves and being far more sensible. Um, we'll just come in. And come and put um, this back down here. So, get all settled in. And then we will be able to talk to you guys about some of the life that we find here. Make sure that's all settled. Perfect. Um, so, what we're going to go through um, is... Um, this Arctic food web idea. So to do this activity, let's just go through some practicalities. So um, what I'm going to do is we're going to spend most of this session just talking about the relation, the different types of living things you find in the Arctic, the relationships between them, and also some of the vocabulary that we use to uh, discuss food webs. So that might be uh, things like uh, producer, consumer, predator, prey. So that's what we're going to focus on. There is a making and colouring element uh, to this activity as well. So some of you may have done that beforehand. Some of you may do it afterwards. But the main focus we're going to do is having a chat through these different animals and learning about them and learning about their relationships. So do feel free to do the making piece afterwards. Um, all in all, the important bits of kit are having a the sheet um, with all the animals on it, like that. I've stuck it to a piece of cardboard that makes it easier to cut out and to uh, make into a mobile. You might also have a list of the arctic organisms and some description about them and we'll go through that together and then we've got a piece here about describing the feeding relationships we'll go through this all together and if you want to do this as a class later afterwards as a good revision and just to check through that's fantastic put those on the desk in terms of making the mobile itself um, I think just for the, the cross pieces, the sticks, these wooden skewers you sometimes get for barbecues are excellent. If you are using them, be very careful of the sharp ends or even consider cutting those ends off or taking them up. Uh, you will need some tape uh, and we only ever have gaffer tape or duct tape in the Arctic, no normal cellar tape, um, but any tape that you have scissors to cut out the cards nice blunt nose scissors some string to make your mobile and then of course you'll be very artistic and using a range of coloring pens or pencils uh, to color in your arctic animals and there is a wonderful slideshow on the encounter ed website if you want to use the colours that are found in nature. So those are the things that you'll need um, to, to have a look at the animals in the Arctic and to talk about Arctic food webs. Now, before we start, um, I just want to get a sense of what animals you think might be found in the Arctic. So have a chat. Um, in your classes, um, get your teacher to pop those up into the live chat box and we'll have, just gain a bit of a sense of what animals and living things you already know um, that are up here in the Arctic region. And um, we'll just get a sense of that. And Ellie, who's behind the camera at the moment, um, will be giving me an update just to see whether We've, and I think there might be some um, that might come through here. 
Um, but as always, um, we will just have a check on here. Um, the oh, here we are. Come in here. Sorry, this there's sometimes the uh, the um, oh, I'll get that back to you, Ollie. Sometimes we get the very slow um, the computers trying to work in the cold up here. So we've got polar bear, excellent. So we've got polar bears coming through, really, really good. So polar bears more common in this region of Svalbard in the summer months when they come over from the north and east coast and they'll be feeding here on uh, bird eggs and uh, fledglings, so that's the young birds. Um, when they're on the uh, north and east coast where there's more sea ice, they'll be hunting traditionally on the sea ice and hunting for seals. Um, but polar bear is very much an issue here. And if we leave the immediate area of the science village, we need to think about polar bear safety, radios, flare pistols and rifles, um, just in case there is an encounter um, to scare the polar bear away. Um, so polar bears, definitely. Um, anything else that we have? Flatwoods Elementary has given a long list. Beluga whale. Perfect, saw one last year. Arctic fox. Saw one last year. Polar bear again. Clams. Clams, yep. Walrus. Walrus, walrus colony just along the coast here. Um, and in terms of whales, the uh, science team just saw a monkey whale, as I mentioned just now, um, out there. We have um, narwhal. I've always wanted to see a narwhal. Um, so not um, around here, more common um, up into the high Arctic with, amongst the sea ice. Um, but would love to see a narwhal that cross between um, a dolphin and a unicorn, a truly magical animal. Um, so... That is really great. Um, so hopefully those, that's a really good start. We're going to go through um, thinking about the food web here and then we'll sort of look how we can link some of the animals. What I've got here is I've cut out um, the cards of the different living things. And we're going to, st in sort of no particular order, we'll just have a sort of think about some of these different uh, living things and how they uh, might be connected. So. Just to go through each of them, we have algae. Now, algae is known as a producer because it gets its energy from the sun through photosynthesis. So it is producing uh, living matter from the sun. So all kinds of algae found up here. Some algae like diatoms, a uh, type of single celled uh, plant like organism. Uh, makes a puffy jacket out of silica. That's a cool polar algae fact there. Uh, then we have other types of animals you might find up here. This is the Arctic cod. Uh, fun fact about the Arctic cod, it has antifreeze in its blood um, to stop that becoming a frozen fish um, in the sea because what you'll find is you get uh, sea temperatures down to about minus 1.8 uh, degrees Celsius, so below freezing. Um, here we have uh, some of our favourites, a, a ringed seal, um, so uh, one of the um, uh, seal species found in the Arctic along with the hooded seal uh, and really, really lovely, um, will probably have a diet of um, fish, so feeding on the Arctic cod as you saw before. Uh, we have the polar bear. Um, some fun adaptations um, for the polar bear. You may or may not know uh, that the polar bear's fur is hollow um, and that traps even more air next to the skin to help insulate um, against the freezing conditions up here. And a polar bear's skin is black uh, to absorb more heat from the sun. Um, so a couple of little polar bear facts. We have um, the Arctic fox, um, wonderful, wonderful Arctic fox is one that lived um, next to the canteen, bit of a poser, um, used to sit on a sort of like a uh, sort of mound of snow and sort of turn its head to sort of look at its best angle. Um, so we've got some photos of that from, from previous years. Uh, we have the uh, walrus. 
um, and as we just mentioned now, there's a walrus colony just down the coast. And one of my favourite uh, terms for walrus is that the biggest male on the beach um, is known as the beach master. Um, so that's you know, the beach master is the alpha male uh, for walrus. We have clams, um, so they live on the bottom of the sea and they filter the seawater taking the small plant-like organisms, the algae, out of uh, the water for their food. We have the beluga whale, so the pale beluga whale, um, saw one last year, uh, and is a tooth whale. So instead of filtering the water um, for plankton, like the big, some of the big whales, like the um, the blue whale or the humpback whale, um, this is actually a tooth whale, so it is eating um, things like fish. And last, but by no means least, uh, we have the copepod. Uh, the copepod is a type of plankton, uh, so those are the creatures that can't swim against the current. Uh, the copepod is the most abundant creature on the planet. It's a type of crustacean, um, so related to lobster and shrimp. And here is a competition for all you teachers out there. You're going to have to write down on the board how many copepods there are in the world. So that's 1,347 billion billion. So that's 1347 and then 18 zeros. Um, so there's something to, to get you going. And it's quite an astonishing number. <coughs> Sorry. But 1,347 billion billion copepods in the world's oceans. So can we just make sure on the live chat all that makes sense? Um, and just to make sure that you're happy um, going through all those different um, living things. Because what I'm going to do now is to think about how they are connected in a food web. I've got one missing one. Uh, we, we have, well, lacking the sun. Has, has has made a beeline somewhere, but we, we can we can work that one out in a bit. So just in terms of food webs and food chains, we're going to start off with the food chain, which is a bit of a simpler complex uh, uh, and so concept. And so what we're going to do is we are going to start with a um, what should we start with? We shall start with a uh, let's start with the copepod, and so the copepod, um, and then we will talk about the copepod a bit, and we will also look at the algae. Let's find out maybe where the, the sun is hiding. The sun has gone away. Um, the algae. And the other ones, we've got the algae, the copepod, and we're going to get the arctic cod. So these are the, oh, I mean the sun, the sun has miraculously appeared, thank you, Ellie. Um, brilliant. So we're going to look at uh, some of these for a basic food chain. And anyway, I'm just going to place them on the, the table down here. So we've got all life starting with energy coming from the sun. Um, there are some exceptions to this in the deep ocean, but we won't worry about that too much today. So the sun powers plants and algae through a process called photosynthesis. And so we call these producers and then Things that consume the producers are we're going to call consumers. So we've got the copepods eating the algae, which are getting their energy from the sun. Now, if we're doing a food chain, it's a chain of energy going through the ecosystem. So energy coming from the sun into the algae, from the algae into the copepod. And if we find something that is eating the uh, copepods we have here the arctic cod so what we're seeing is how these living things are related in a food chain 
So algae energy goes into the Kerber pod, energy from the Kerber pod into the Arctic cod. So the names that we can give to organisms that get their energy from the sun are producers, energy uh, organisms or living things that get their energy from eating something else we call consumers. Now we can look at some other feeding relationships and talk a little bit about predator and prey. Um, and I might just use the Arctic cod again and maybe the polar bear as well. So at the top of this food chain, I'm going to put the Arctic cod and I'm going to think about what kind of animal in the Arctic might eat the Arctic cod. You've probably got some guesses you're making in the classroom. Now, in this case, the Arctic cod is the prey and I'm looking for the predator. So I'm looking for the animal that eats the Arctic cod, the predator. And I am going to go for the ringed seal. And then I'm going to see that the ring seal is in fact both predator and prey because something else is going to eat the ring seal. So I'm going to ask you to think through the remaining cards you have. Is that the clam? Is that the beluga whale? Is that the walrus? Or we might then go for the polar bear. So the polar bear is the top predator in the Arctic. The science name for that is the apex predator. So they're at the top of the food chain. So it goes uh, from the energy going from the Arctic cod, it's the prey, going energy going to the ring seal, that's the predator. They're both consumers. And then predator-prey relationship. So the top predator is the polar bear eating its prey, the ringed seal. <laughs> And so what we're going to look at now is whether we can combine all these different relationships into something um, more complex, um, as into a food web, which more accurately um, sort of relates how different organisms eat each other and how they get their energy up in the Arctic. So if I start up here, is that okay? So first of all, I've got the sun, and then I've got the, um, the algae. And then the animals are eating the algae, the two of them, put them in the next level down. We've got the clam, and then the copepod. Um, in terms of animals eating the clams, we've got the walrus over here, um, and then the animals eating the, what else is going to, eating the, um, okay, we've got the arctic cod, animals eating the arctic cod, we've got the beluga whale, and the seal, and then our animals eating the seal, got baby seals might get eaten by a fox and we've got the polar bear as well so we're just going to describe some of the uh, feeding relationships here um, uh, out in the the waters of the fjord and so in your classroom hopefully what we're, you're looking at is going from the Sun to the algae. From the algae, we've got these two uh, smaller organisms. So we've got the copepod and the clam. We've got the walrus mooching about in the bottom, um, so eating the clams. And then we've got the copepods, the fish, fish being eaten by the seal and the beluga whale and the seal becoming food for babies, potentially for the arctic fox, and then also for the polar bear. 
So if you're eating another animal, you're a predator. If you're being eaten by another animal, you're the prey. If you're getting energy from the sun directly, you're a producer. If you're getting energy from eating something else, you are a consumer. And here we start to see how all life in the Arctic is linked. This is an example from the Arctic, but you can also make food webs uh, for other habitats and ecosystems. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a better idea about how life is connected in the Arctic and you will be able to put that into a food web, um, maybe this lesson or perhaps in a later lesson. So we're just going to look at uh, some of the questions coming through and for some reason they haven't come through to my uh, laptop at the moment just to answer so I'm just going to check if those are coming through at all. Um, and why we're not getting those coming through. Um, here we are. So we have how uh, King's College, the British School of Panama, is how is global warming affecting Arctic food chains and webs? It's a really, really great question. Um, the evidence that we've seen um, has, I mean, there's, there's, there's several things that we can talk about. So one of the things that we see directly here is that um, we were seeing that we're getting early, earlier rain um, and warming temperatures. And what that does is it creates a um, an ice layer in the snow. So what we're seeing is that the reindeer near here and the Arctic fox can't get through that layer of ice that forms. We get sort of rain in March, it then freezes. And instead of there being sort of nice snow to get through, you've just got a layer of ice. And so the reindeer can't get their hooves through that to get to the moss and the, the plants uh, underneath the snow for food. Uh, the Arctic foxes um, can't access uh, food caches uh, from the winter, and so they're suffering too. Um, in terms of then feeding platforms is that there are, there's less sea ice, so the natural feeding platform uh, for the polar bear is, is diminishing. Um, also, in terms of the amount of sea ice, so sea ice is a habitat and a lot of the bottom dwelling animals in the Arctic Ocean um, who rely on particles of food coming down marine snow from the sea ice, um, they are missing out too with there being less uh, sea ice um, on, on the surface. Um, so all round is putting great stress um, on the animals in the Arctic. Uh, here we have, um, are the animals at the top of the food chain affected by microplastics? And that's from Union Point Academy. Um, certainly there is evidence um, that microplastics um, are accumulating uh, up the food chain. Um, that was, I think it was one paper I saw that, and that was um, mackerels and seals um, in the um, study in the UK. Um, so uh, that's one thing um, that's been um, pointed out. Whether they're being affected by that microplastics is still an area of study. So most of the harm being caused to large animals, top predators, is by eating um, large bits of plastic and those starting to, to clog up um, the intestine and to block the intestine and, and stop um, those animals from eating any more and, and, and potentially starving. Um, so that's in terms of ingestion um, of, micro, of plastic, plastics, large plastics, microplastics. We do have a microplastics um, special um, next week with Dr. Kerry Lewis. Um, but from, from what I've read is that we're, we're looking, one piece of research that's ongoing is to what extent the uh, chemicals associated with those microplastics is eating microplastics causing more harm. Um, because of that, and that's a, an area area of research, current research. Um, from Flatwoods Elementary School, this is a great question. How many countries are there exploring the Arctic? Lots. <laughs> um, certainly, I know that there are um, at least 11 countries with uh, research stations here on Svalbard alone. In the International Science Village here in the Olesund, um, there are 
10 countries with research stations um, and that is, I'm going to have to go, th go through them now, um, Norway, um, UK obviously, uh, Germany, France, Italy, I think um, the Netherlands, India, China, Japan and Korea. Uh, those are the countries uh, with uh, research stations up here. There's also a Polish research station on Svalbard, but it's very international feel and it requires experts from many different countries to really understand an environment like the Arctic and, and, and indeed for, for all scientific endeavour to share those ideas across borders. Uh, here we are. So um, does the Arctic wolf have any natural predators? And uh, that's from Union Point uh, Academy. Uh, really good question. I'm not an Arctic wolf uh, expert. Um, I think they're further over um, in North America and I spent most of my time um, in the Arctic on Svalbard uh, and further north than where the Arctic wolf reaches up on the, the Canadian sea ice. Um, from what I know, there are, there are no natural predators um, to the Arctic um, wolf, um, but they may, you know, I mean, I suppose, you know, are there any natural predators? You could say the human is a natural predator. We are part of of nature, uh, and and we will, um, you know, people people have trapped um, the Arctic wolf for fur over the over the centuries, so we could be seen as a predator. Uh, next up, uh, have we seen many gulls um, in your area? Um, so straight gulls, um, not so much. Um, but the three types of, well, we're going through sort of four types of seabird that we're seeing up here. Uh, we're seeing uh, skewers, we're seeing fulmers, uh, we're seeing guillemots, uh, and also eider, um, eider duck. Um, that's where eider dan comes from. Uh, I saw a snow bunting um, just outside, so that's the first one of the season, very exciting. And also um, one of my favourites around here is a little orc, um, spelt A-U-K. A uh, really sweet little bird, but haven't seen one so far this year. Um, here's a great question coming in from Flatwoods uh, Elementary School. Do you ride a dog sled around for transportation? Um, there are people who have uh, dog teams up here, and it is still a form of Arctic travel. Um, dogs are currently banned in Antarctica, um, so they are not used for Antarctic travel anymore. Um, but um, there are dog teams here, but in terms of getting around, most people use skidoos um, and that's like a snowmobile um, and that's in turn, if you're doing glacial work, um, then you'll go up on a skidoo um, and if, if there's no snow in the summer, then it's a big old walk out or, or maybe a bike, bicycle ride out to your research site. Uh, we are studying the sea and there is no sea ice, so the only way that we can get out um, to where we are working is by boat. So we are working and sampling by boat at the moment. Uh, so, so very sadly, not using a dog team. Nick Cox, um, who's the station manager here, um, who will be speaking tomorrow about uh, life in the Arctic. He's been working in the Arctic on and off for about 40 years. Um, he is highly experienced at working with dogs in both polar regions. So if you are around tomorrow, um, flat, uh, I think that's Flatwoods, um, please do join us um, to chat with Nick same time tomorrow. Uh, no, sort of, uh, in, it's on, it's on the website, <laughs> someone, someone will uh, be able to post the, to post the time for your time, time zone, but do join us for that. Um, so do you see orca in the Arctic? Um, that, that's from PD Graham, first graders. Um, Great question. Orca, I'd love to see an orca. We have not seen an orca here in the Arctic. The uh, whales that we have seen are minke and beluga. Um, so not a an orca yet. So maybe, who knows, maybe we'll see one um, over the next week um, while we are up here. But um, no, really, really interesting. Um, and PD Graham first graders would also like to know what kind of food do you eat in the Arctic? And now that, that's an interesting question because that really differs depending on where you are. So my first time in the Arctic was on a remote uh, field station. We were camping on the sea ice and everything we had, we had to fly in with us. So that was a very, very different 
I experience here, um, you know, we are resupplied by ship about um, every month or so, and that makes the food here a bit more uh, developed, <laughs> if that's one way of putting it. And we all eat together in um, a mess hall or dining hall, all the different nationalities eating together, which is a great experience. Um, and the food's very, very important, not just nutritionally, but emotionally as well. And so the, the cooks here, chefs here are fantastic and put a lot of effort into making good food. So we have lots of lovely things from cereal and eggs and not together um, <laughs> for breakfast um, or toast. Lunch, actually, we normally have a sandwich uh, because we don't know whether we'll be out in the field and things might change. We make some sandwiches just so we can we can we can get out and about if we need to. And then dinner is everything uh, from stews to um, pasta to meatballs to cod to, um, you know, lots of amazing things. Um, I suppose the weird ones you might have, you might have reindeer um, up here uh, for supper, which you might not get on, on, on many other menus. Uh, but thinking about, you know, the kind of sort of amount of calories you have to eat so that if you're working in the Arctic remote, living in unheated tents, minus, um, you know, 25, minus 40, um, either in Celsius or Fahrenheit, it's about the same, um, or minus 40 is the same, uh, then you're eating a lot of calories. So you're eating, you know, 4,000, 5,000 calories a day just to stay warm. And maybe a thousand or more if you're if you're doing uh, like moving a lot of snow, digging snow holes, um, doing quite a lot of phys like physical exercise. Um, and you've got people who are pulling pulks, so pulling the sleds across the Arctic by hand on skis, and, and that's you're looking at potentially seven, eight thousand calories a day, and that's four times the number of calories that's recommended for an adult male. So really the cold. Um, puts an enormous pressure on your body and you're and eating far, far more. Um, so food's really important in the polar regions, both because you have to burn more for the cold, you have to burn more if you're um, undergoing a sort of physical um, you know, strain, uh, and then on the emotional level, because if you are working through the cold or the dark or, or some quite difficult conditions, having a nice hot meal is, is really, really amazing. And if you read any of the sort of diaries of sort of polar explorers of yore, whether it's the Scott Shackleton's, Amundsen's, Anson's of this world, um, the food aspect in their diaries really comes up. And I was sort of just reading some of Nansen's diaries, uh, Fritz Joff Nansen's diaries um, last night, and the sort of like the, the power of a hot chocolate um, or just even a sort of nugget of chocolate to, to raise his spirits on, on his crossing of Greenland was, was, was quite amazing. Uh, some things never change, some things never change. So chocolate is, is incredibly important, uh, both as an energy boost and as a mental boost as well. Uh, has the earlier melt affected your research station or research? Um, and that's from Union Point Academy. It's it's more uh, talking about the sort of earlier melt um, and the sort of plus degrees and sort of Feb March um, and the rain and I think that's more of a fluctuation. So we're just seeing the sort of like odd odd days of of melt and, and rain come in early in the season, uh, and then it can be down to minus twenty. So you can have a sort of minus twenty or twenty degree sort of fluctuation over just a few days, um, twenty degrees sort of um, Celsius, which is um, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, you can have that change in just a couple of days. Um, has it affected the research? It does sometimes. Um, we've had times inside glaciers where there's this sort of like um, melting, freezing, and bits of ice have fallen off. Um, we've had difficulty getting the skidoos across to up the glacier. We've had to um, sort of have a massive run up across a slushy stream, which should have been frozen solid. And we've had to sort of um, aqua, aqua plane a skidoo across a, a sort of half frozen uh, stream, which was quite exciting. Um, <laughs> if that got stuck, that would have been a bit boring, but we managed to get it sort of going, going fast enough. Um, it is, it, it's the, the, 
the sort of in-between bit where it's slushy, um, so you can't use a skidoo, um, but you can't, it's difficult to walk. Um, so it really affects your ability to get around. Um, if there's no sea ice, it makes it more difficult. If there's um, no firm snow, it makes it more difficult. So definitely the, the earlier melt does, does affect your ability to travel around by, you know, by, by any method. Um, so that makes it much more difficult. Wow. Um, PD Graham, first graders, you would love to know how cold is it in the Arctic? At the moment, it is not too cold. It is about minus five Celsius. Probably feels like minus 15 with the wind up. Um, coldest temperature I have had in the Arctic um, is 48 below, which I think is about 55 below in, in Fahrenheit. Uh, and then with wind chill down to minus 70 Fahrenheit. So that is minus 59 um, Celsius. Uh, in terms of coldest, coldest temperature, I think it's minus 65, minus 70 Celsius. These, this all probably means nothing. It's just numbers. Um, but I think when you, when you get down to sort of towards minus 40 um, Celsius or Fahrenheit, uh, is it, it really is a different type of cold. And I was talking about this before. Um, it, it just hurts. And your whole body is straining uh, to produce enough warmth um, and to stop yourself from from basically freezing to death and it really feels like sort of every part of your body is just like it's running a marathon the whole time and it's tired and it hurts and you just live through it um, so I'd say that the the cold is different here once you get below sort of minus 25 celsius down towards the minus 40s it really is tough um, very very tough and it's a different kind of pain um, one that um, you kind of never want to have to deal with again uh, and it's really tough at the time but you are able to experience some amazing things by being out um, in those kind of conditions as well uh, from Flatwoods Elementary School what are some problems you have encountered on your expedition? Well, on this expedition, I think there's been a problem every single day. Uh, first of all, I mean, on this expedition, uh, we had a pilot strike, uh, meaning that we couldn't get up to Svalbard, so we managed to negotiate that and eventually got up uh, two days late. Uh, we then, the plane that was supposed to get us up then had technical difficulties. Um, and so we nearly we didn't fly. We got up there with half an hour to spare to get our charter flight over the mountains to get to the science station. Um, two of the leads that we brought up with us um, don't work. I managed to phone a friend of a friend in Longyearbyen, the main town, just over the hills, 25 minutes flight away. He got a lead on the flight this morning. So within 14 hours, we had a spare lead up with us. Um, the formaldehyde we need for fixing our samples, so formaldehyde is a type of preserving poison which you put in samples so that the condition that you you collected the water, so you kill all the sort of um, algae and the photosynthesis, so that this means that the chemical condition is exactly the same as when you, as when you pulled it out of the sea and the bi those biological uh, processes stop. Uh, that is somewhere. Um, in between um, the UK and the Arctic um, on its six week journey. Uh, we also some other um, poison for fixing, um, we call it poison, it's a toxic substance to stop the chemical biological processes in seawater that we picked up by the skin of our teeth in Longyearbyen. Uh, uh, the weather's been so rough today that we've had to do the um, researchers on board the small boat have had to take it in shifts because they've been so seasick they've been throwing up over the side. Uh, I think that's all, and we've been here for three days. <laughs> so I think that's um, so those are just some of the problems. As far as I probably shouldn't say sort of throwing up to a primary school audience, but being being being, being sick over the side um, of, of 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 the boat. So that that's so working in the Arctic. Um, everything's simple until it's not. 
uh, I think you know, which sounds which sounds sort of like an obvious thing to say. And I was just thinking that that it's really important to have experienced people with you um, because when things go wrong, you just have to sort it out where you are. There's no one you can turn to. You can't go to the shop. You can't just go home for a day and sort of you know then come back tomorrow and try again because you're up here. You're pretty isolated, and there's you know there's really no um, external external sort of like other help to to go to. But the community here is amazing, and gather together to, to make things work. But having experienced people up here to help is really really important. Uh, um, have you had any dangerous encounters with any animals? Um, that's from Flatwood Elementary School. Um, we had an angry sea angel yesterday. No, it wasn't very angry. Um, so the animals that we're looking at at the moment are called plankton. They're tiny, tiny wee. And so we get these tiny animals. We've got sea angel, very, very beautiful type of pteropod. Um, we also have um, some krill and some cobapods under the microscope. Um, dangerous encounters. Um, no polar bear encounters yet, but it's something we have to be very careful about. And you never quite know, do you want to have a polar bear encounter? Uh, because it is one of those, um, Ellie's shaking her head behind the camera. And by encounter, I think what I mean is you can see it very long way away, a long way away. And if it starts to come towards you, you fire a flare gun and the bang scares it away. And there isn't a, a proper encounter um, because that really would be just, just I think, sad, uh, frightening and then sad um, because they're amazing animals. Um, and so, no, no dangerous, um, unless you see some particularly angry reindeer, um, might get dangerous. Um, there's a vicious snow bunting on the roof um, that will peck your, you know, wrists off. No, there aren't any dangerous snow buntings. Snow buntings are wonderful. The reindeer are herbivores, so they eat plants. Um, so at the moment, not too dangerous. Personally, um, dangerous animal encounters I have had. Um, I don't like snakes. I've had an encounter with a king cobra in India. I've had encounters with sea snakes in Timor Leste, and I've had also other reptiles not so fond of. I had an encounter with a, a saltwater crocodile in Australia. So those are all things I am unkeen on, and I will not like to have those encounters again. Thank you very much. Um, wow, we we have gone over time. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all your questions. Uh, thank you so much to all those schools who've been uh, working with us, um, to Flatwood Elementary, uh, to uh, Armunica International School, to Roo, um, and to Union Point Academy, to PD Graham Elementary School. Been really, really great um, having you with us. Thank you so much for taking part. Uh, do share your experiences online, um, uh, hashtag Arctic Live and at Encounter EDU. And do join us again. We've got some great sessions coming up. We've got an expert interview with Clara, part of the science team, in just over an hour. Sorry. And we have uh, Keeping Warm and Nick Cox, the station manager, coming up tomorrow. So for now, it's goodbye from AXA XL Arctic Live and hope to see you soon. Bye bye.